uh, first of all, Jim, thank you for your work uh, of, of many, many lectures now that we're making available uh, through WordMP3.com and, of course, all the books and articles and information you've provided over the many years. I want to ask, first of all, to tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. Um, I'm actually descended on my father's side from a long line of Methodist and before that Church of England ministers. Uh, but my father was the first in, in all that line uh, not to be. He was very active in the church, and, but he was a professor of literature, of French literature. And uh, my mother was, uh, had her uh, degree in Latin and in piano. So uh, we were, I grew up listening to classical music, uh, especially fairly unusual uh, Renaissance and uh, French Baroque music that was pretty hard to come by in the early 50s. But that was my father's hobby. And um, I, I mention that because I think that a sensitivity to uh, the way music works helps in understanding the way the Holy Spirit has sung the Bible into existence. There are repeated themes that come and go. Um, there are themes that are played on top of each other, just like in music. Um, the same melody or the same storyline, like an Exodus event, happens over and over again, but with variations. And some some knowledge of music, I think, is very helpful in hermeneutics. Uh, but passing beyond that, uh, my parents, my mother was Southern Baptist. My parents had met while my father was teaching at Salem College, which was Moravian. And they wound up going to the Moravian Church and becoming Moravians. The Moravian service is like the Lutheran service. Um, at the time, a fairly sung liturgy, a lot of Reformation-era music. Uh, when they moved to Athens, Georgia, where I was born and where I grew up, uh, there was no such church there, and they wound up back in the Methodist church, but my father objected to the liberalism that was there. So my brother and I got sent down to the Southern Baptist Church to go to Sunday school every Sunday, and uh, we went to Southern Baptist Vacation Bible School when we were little kids. And in the second grade, uh, my folks decided that the Catholic day school parochial school had a better educational system than the public school, so I got sent to Catholic school for grades two through six, and this was pre-Vatican II, so I was immersed uh, as a non-Catholic in a lot of Catholic forms and had sisters for teachers, went occasionally to Stations of the Cross and things like that. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, a Lutheran church, what is now the ELCA, started up within walking distance of my house. And my mother started walking up there. She had my infirm grandmother to care for at the house. And my, once my father met the pastor, uh, they hit it off. He was an evangelical. My dad loved to talk about theology, and this man was theologically acute. So I wound up being baptized at the a age of 10 or 11 or so, I can't remember what, uh, into the, uh, no, it was more like 8 into the Lutheran Church and started going to the Lutheran Church. We had a full sung service at that time, and I developed a real love for an appreciation for the dance of a through-composed liturgy. So there is a real mixed background. When I got into college, by that time the Lutheran pastor was quite liberal. I was directing the choir in the Lutheran Church, but I wound up going to campus crusade meetings most of the time, and when I got into the service, I was going to navigator meetings. By this time, I had read enough. I had read my way into a sort of a continental Calvinism. I had become a real disciple of Skilder and of Rush Dooney just from reading books. So I thought, well, I'm Reformed, so I started going to a Presbyterian church. But uh, I've never quite been a Presbyterian. I've always been a little bit closer to a mixture of uh, Episcopal and continental Reformed in my outlook. But in the South... Uh, the closest thing is Presbyterian, so I've hung around in those circles. So that's a little bit of background. In, in terms of my own interest in high school, I always thought I wanted to major in music, but uh, my hands have never allowed me to perform music as well as I wanted to, and you just can't get a degree in music theory and history without having to play recitals, and I didn't want to have to do that. So I wound up minoring in it and studying in it quite a lot, um, which was quite useful. I, I uh, had Christian teachers at the University of Georgia, and uh, I did papers on uh, the uh, influence of Gregorian chant on Lutheran chorales and things like that when I was in college. But I wound up majoring in 
in comparative literature. So these interests in literature and music, and I guess the third thing that happened to me in college was since I was politically active as a conservative uh, activist in college, uh, I took several courses in political philosophy that were taught by a disciple of Leo Strauss. And the advantage of that is that the Straussians teach you how to read ancient literature very carefully. And I learned that the ancients, since they didn't have a lot of paper, they had to make every word count. And I became familiar with things like chiastic structures, uh, double uh, layers of meaning uh, in the works of Plato and Machiavelli and others, uh, that when I got into studying the Bible, I began to see, well, of course, this is ancient literature. Every word had to count. The same kinds of things are found there. So that's my background up until I went into the Air Force. After that, I went to Reform Seminary in Jackson, which at that time was a pretty broadly reformed in, uh, school. There were a lot of Dutch Reformed teachers there. There were teachers from several different traditions. It's not that way in Jackson now. And I wound up going up to Westminster and finishing up there. You, you mentioned a few, but maybe just to highlight a couple of specifics that gave you a mind toward reading the Scripture the way you do. Well, yeah, I did mention, uh, I suppose, uh, two major early influences on me were Rush, R.J. Rush Dooney, because he read the Bible in a total world context. And so the Bible is addressed to the total man in the total world, in the total life context. And that is actually the, the traditional and ancient way of reading the Bible before we became Americans and totally privatized our faith. And so it's not a matter of trying to force a political theology into the Bible or anything like that. It's just a recognition that the Bible, as it goes along, it has all kinds of information that's relevant to all of life. And among the Calvinistic philosophers... Uh, of the early 20th century, I liked Rush Dooney the best because he had the Bible open the most. So that would be one major influence. And the other was that while I was sitting around in the Air Force, uh, I was a historian in the Air Force, and that meant, without going into it, that every three months I worked very hard for several weeks, and then I had a couple of weeks with not a whole lot to do. Uh, and I read a lot of books. And the one book I read was called Sola Scriptura, by Sidney Kraidanis, and that was a description of the controversy in the Netherlands over whether the Bible should be read moralistically or as the story of redemption or the story of the covenant, uh, where everything is marching forward on a chronological timeline. And in the course of just reading through this book, which was just kind of a slog-by-slog -slog description of all the controversies and who said what, um, I became very impressed that the Bible is giving us history. Uh, the, the Bible is giving us history in a typological form and that certain patterns repeat, but they don't repeat absolutely, and that everything is marching forward. The Bible is really a, a biography of Adam leading down to the second Adam, exactly the right time in history for the second Adam to come. And so paying very close attention to the historical information, the chronological information, was pretty much drilled into me. And at the same time, Grydonis and uh, some of the other uh, Dutch Reformed thinkers were emphasizing uh, the typological side of things, too, that there are certain patterns and structures and archetypes in the Bible. And I was fortunate when I went to Reformed Theological Seminary to have uh, Dr. Uh, Gerard van Groningen as uh, one of my Old Testament profs, and he was very much in this line of thinking. Uh, he uh, taught us a great deal about these kinds of things. So um, becoming convinced of the need for the church to sing the Psalms, becoming convinced that the so-called Mosaic Law, which isn't really Mosa it's not really a law code, it's instruction uh, on all kinds of issues, um, that that was still relevant today. Uh, all of these things just made me more and more interested in discovering what the Bible says and how it says it. Some people would know the name Rush Dooney and, and, and the Reconstructionist movement. Um, just before we get too far, I want to talk about biblical typology stuff, but just since that name was referenced, some people get very nervous when they hear about Christian Reconstructionism and uh, Rush Dooney and so forth. Could you just say a word or two about that and how you relate to that now and, and how what, what role do you see that has had in the past? Well, it was one of those movements that... Um if you want to call it a movement, we tried not to call it that and call it a conversation, but 
everything gets called a movement. It was an attempt to reopen the historical Christian way of reading the Bible and of understanding civilization. Uh, there were two large flaws in the situation. The first one was that Rush Dooney, having grown up in the middle of the 20th century when uh, the church in America was just about dead, moribund, found that nowhere were the churches even interested in the kind of stuff he was talking about, at least where he was, and he came to have a pretty low view of the local church and of worship, so that once we, uh, once I and some of my associates in the 1980s began to try to say, no, wait, the church has to be the center and sort of the powerhouse of Christendom, uh, Rush Dooney didn't want to go along with that and broke with us. And the other was that they, almost all the people that got drawn to this, uh, these ideas early on were people with strong opinions and strong personalities who didn't get along with each other. And uh, people like me, uh, who are much more get-along-with-each-other types. <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't an only child. I have spent time in the military doing close-order drill. I've sung in choirs. I've played in musical ensembles. I know what it is to work with other people and things, but I can tell you the other leaders in the Christian Reconstructionist movement were, to a man, devoid of any such experiences. So there just wound up being a whole lot of personality fights and fights over turf, and a bunch of us finally said, you know, this is not the context in which we want to be. But that does not change the fact that the books that were written, and all, all of us have feet of clay, and the books that were written by Rush Dooney, especially early on, and some of the, some of the writings of Gary North uh, and of others, are quite valuable and shouldn't be forgotten. Thank you. I appreciate just a little bit of your perspective on that, because I think to some people that's a red herring to keep, keep us from moving forward. Uh, in, in looking at the value, and that's that's a good word. What are some of the important differences between the way we read and write in the modern world and during biblical times? You alluded to this earlier, but maybe you can unpack that a bit. And how does this affect our reading of the Bible? Well, uh, the two things to bear in mind are, in the ancient world, very few people read and write. And so to be trained in the ability to read and write, and of course a, pre a person who could do that is called a scribe. To be trained in the ability to do that is kind of like having a, uh, being a doctor of physics today. Uh, you were trained to write in such a way that you maximized the space available to write in. And if you're having to put stuff on clay tablets or on very expensive vellum or even papyrus, um, you, you have to write carefully. And that is one thing that has to be borne in mind. When we read the Bible, we're not reading it. We're not reading like a, no a modern novel or like a textbook or like a newspaper article. It's just not written that way. Uh, it's written fairly compactly. Even those parts that seem to go on and on and repeat things, that's done for a very pr particular purpose. Like the, the story of Abraham's servant coming to uh, meet Rebecca, And then uh, large parts of that chapter 26... Uh, excuse me, chapter 24, seem to repeat. He says everything twice. It goes over the same story. But there's a very important reason why that's so, and so we have to ask, why, why is the scribe taking so much space to do that? <laughs> so much valuable papyrus. Um, this is a tremendous skill. Uh, and, and large chiastic structures uh, covering whole books, uh, very intricate uh, patterns of writing simply occur. And you begin to realize that the people who wrote the Bible were, were men like Mozart or Beethoven or Bach in music. They, they composed, uh, and what they composed was very skillfully done. And so once, once you become aware of that, then you begin to see what's there, hear what's there, uh, and become aware of it, in addition to the fact that the Holy Spirit is working with these men. And you mentioned chiasms and chiastic structures. Let me just ask more generally, and you can define that as well for, for people that may not be uh, ready to go on all this. What are <laughs> some of the literary and poetic aspects of the Bible that you uh, find to be useful in understanding it? And could you give us kind of a short, simple definition of some of those to help people get started in, in the understanding? Well, um, let's just start with chiasms. Chiasm is a structure that goes A, B, C, D, CBA. He goes into a middle and comes back out. The middle is usually a, a turning point in whatever the story is, and then we move back out again. So, 
the reason that this exists in the literature of the Bible is that the Bible is a form of the Word of God, and the Word of God is a person. We don't need to talk about whether the Bible is an incarnation or an inscripturation. There's debates about that. I'm not interested in that. Uh, but it is, it's about people. So, let's say that I'm going to go to the grocery store. I go into the kitchen. I look in my shelves and see what I need, and I make a list. I go out of my kitchen, out the front door, into my car. I start my car. I back out of the driveway, and I drive to the grocery store following a certain route. When I get to the grocery store, I get a shopping cart. I go through the store, and I fill the shopping cart up to the top. Then I check out. Now everything is going to go backwards. When I check out, I'm going to take the stuff off the stop top and work my way back down to the bottom in something like reverse order that I put them in. And after I've gotten them all checked out and in bags, I'll take them back out to my car. I'll start my car back up again. I'll drive back home following the same route backwards. I'll park my car. I'll walk into my house. I'll go into my kitchen, and I'll put those groceries up on the shelf in the empty spaces. Now, that's a chiasm. And that's what we do in life all the time. We get out of bed. We take off our pajamas. We wash up, we put on our day clothes, we go to work, we go to lunch, we go back to work, we come home, we rest, we take off our day clothes, we wash up a bit, put on our night clothes, and go back into bed. That's how human life is lived, and that's why in the Bible that kind of structure shows up over and over and over again. So once you become aware of that, that the Bible is just like life, it's not written in some strange way, it's written exactly the way we live and move and have our being, then some other things you can add to it. One is Genesis chapter 1, the seven days, gives us really the, one of the most fundamental patterns in the Bible. Because God is a God who is always doing new things, and so there are creation and recreation passages in the Bible. And a lot of scholars have noticed uh, that the construction of the tabernacle in the book of Exodus follows the seven days of Genesis 1 at a symbolic level. The seven night visions of Zechariah 1 to 6 follow Genesis 1 uh, at a symbolic level. And there are numerous other passages that are like that. Uh, and Genesis 1 itself has a kind of a chiastic structure. The world was without form and empty and dark. On day one, we get light. On day two, we get forming with the firmament between heaven and earth. Day three, we get filling with plants all over the earth. Then on day four, we go back to light. On day five, we fill the earth with fish and birds. On day six, man is put over everything under God, so that's form again, and we come back to the light of the Sabbath day. That structure recurs in the Bible many, many, many times. So once you start to get a handle on it, you're starting to get a handle on a big, a lot of how the Bible is put together. Um, the other thing I would say is that there are certain kinds of archetypes in the Bible. If you look at uh, important people meeting their wives, where do they meet their wives? They meet them at wells. Adam met his wife in the Garden of Eden which had a river flowing in it. And then uh, uh, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, is met at a well. And Jacob meets his wife at a well. And Moses meets his wife at a well. And Jesus has a conversation with a Samaritan woman about husbands at a well. And then you find in the tabernacle itself, there's a large well of water, which is uh, adorned with feminine lilies. And right next to it is a, a pillar representing the king, which is adorned with a masculine lily. And so... The whole idea of meeting women at wells and the association of women with water and life is throughout the Bible. And when the people of Israel, uh, when Miriam dies in the book of Numbers, the next thing, thing we read is that they found a well of water, that her death provides water somehow. So this is something that you begin to pick up, that there are these fundamental pictures of reality in the Bible, that women have something to do with giving forth life, water, children, men do other kinds of things. And when you pick up on that, then again, it helps you to see the additional depths of what's there in the text. Along those lines, there's uh, the question that I had planned to ask was, what are typologies and what kinds of imagery is important in the Bible? And you've already 
story. I've already said something about that. Yes. <laughs> You've already preempted that with reference to the series, The Garden of God. You, you talk about heaven and earth models. What do the models of, of heaven and earth do as far as those fundamental archetypes? Well, we're, we are told in the beginning that uh, God made the heaven and the earth, and it, it certainly seems that they are face to face with the, the glory light of God in between them. But then on the second day, a firmament is put between the heavens and the earth. We find out that the earth is without form and void and dark, and it gradually develops. We find in Psalm 139 that human beings, who after all are made of soil, we are also knit together in the womb, and we, we kind of grow from formlessness and darkness and emptiness out into the world. That's what things are like in this world. This world is growing up to become like heaven. Heaven is kind of like the fully made model, and the world is growing up into that model in a new kind of way. And so what the Bible does is it shows us into heaven, and then that heaven is reproduced on the earth in various phases. Moses is shown heaven, and Moses comes down, and under God's direction, uh, he and, and his assistants build the tabernacle. But David is shown heaven, and what David gives Solomon to build is the temple, which is considerably more glorious and different. And Ezekiel is shown a heavenly archetype, but his is even more glorious. And John in Revelation is shown a heavenly archetype, and it's even more glorious what he describes as being set up on the earth, which is the church. So the world is moving from glory to glory, and when people are shown what's up in heaven— Heaven is being revealed in phases uh, so that the world goes along that way. That's at the sort of symbolic level where you, you build an architecture that represents society. The uh, curtains and all the different aspects of the tabernacle are pictures of human beings in various functions. We provide bread for each other like the to table of showbread. We shine light for each other and guard each other like the lampstand. Uh, we pray for each other at the altar of incense. All those things are about people and what people do uh, in the presence of God and in the kingdom. That's the way they have to be understood. Um, where was I going with that? Well, you have a model, a symbolic model, but heaven and earth are also the the rulers and the ruled in society, uh, so that the sun, moon, and stars in, uh, in Joseph's vision represent his mother and his father and his brothers. Um, but the sun, moon, and stars of, of Babylon or Syria or something in the prophets rep represents the ruling class and the powers of that country, just as the stars on our flag represent the states. So we have... Uh, in the Bible and even in other cultures, uh, heavenly imagery is used for the rulers of society. Queen Elizabeth, for instance, was called Oriana, which is the feminine form of Orion, Orion the great hunter in the sky. So she was called Oriana, the heavenly huntress. Uh, so that's just one little teeny example of how we continue to use heavenly sky type symbolism for rulers and governors, and the Bible does that. So every time there's a new covenant or a really a new creation in the Bible, you get a new heaven and a new earth. You get yeah. new groups of people who are rulers, uh, new groups of uh, a new definition of who the people are, uh, new symbols that represent that society, and so forth. And in, in that little series, The Garden of God, and in my book, Through New Eyes, which is sort of the book form of it, I've tried to investigate how each of these Heaven and Earth models comes and transforms the world that came before as the history moves from glory to glory. In the Garden of God series, you, you speak of world models and the way that they are models of heaven and earth, but I think a lot of people think that new heavens and new earth, when they see that language, they think about the end of the physical universe. What? How would you persuade someone that, that that's not the only way to think about that idea in Scripture? Oh, I think that the way you do it would... Uh, would be the way that's on these uh, lectures here, which since you're listening to this interview, you already have the, <laughs> you already have the lectures too. Uh, you go through the Bible and show that heaven and earth are used in this political sense, that there is a political heaven and earth, so to speak, uh, or a societal heaven and earth that undergoes changes. Um, 
And this is all pointing, yes, to a change in the physical universe. You know, we do, do have some people floating around nowadays who say that this universe is never going to end and there's never going to be a physical resurrection and there's never going to be a transformation of the star universe. But I don't think that's true. I mean, the Bible certainly says there's going to be a resurrection and a, a new physical configuration of the heavens and earth. But that doesn't mean that these things don't happen in a preliminary way in various phases in the history of the Bible itself. So you just kind of go through and show, yeah, here's, here's where it speaks this way and uses this language, heaven and earth, in a social fashion. And you hope that people are willing to uh, start using language the way the Bible uses it. <laughs> and, and in that series, since this is especially to introduce that, you know, our views change, and I think you've been a good example of someone who said, yeah, I used to believe this, but I don't think this is right anymore in some of your books. Uh, but what, what about the Garden of God? That sort of fundamental series on, on interpreting these kinds of things, can you think of anything... Uh, over the years on that that you have changed in or maybe even just grown deeper in, not necessarily a fundamental change or that you would say that was a mistake. Do you need to write a book like Augustine wrote on retractions on the Garden of God? I did that so many years ago and I, I didn't listen to it again uh, in preparation for this interview. I think it was so uh, general that I don't know that there's anything in particular that I need to revise on it. The, the one thing that I do know that if it's not on those tapes, it is in uh, the book form through New Eyes, is that I said the Battle of Gog and Magog had to do with uh, the invasion of Palestine by the uh, Emperor uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV, the Greek emperor who was ruling Israel at that time. And I have completely changed my mind about that. I think the, the Battle of Gog and Magog is a symbolic description of what's going on in the book of Esther. So if that shows up in those tapes, then <laughs> that would be one retractation uh, to say, no, I think that uh, I think uh, Haman the Agagite and Gog and the Battle of Haman Gog, those things all link up, and the, the better interpretation of, of that passage would be uh, just to link it up with the entire book of Esther, and I, I have written on that other places. You talk about that, Jim, in the Ezekiel series. You deal with that in Ezekiel uh, 37, 38, 39, right. and also in the Revelation series, uh, you you spend a fair amount of time on that when you get to Revelation chapter 20, and so those are at wet places where you could find more of that content. Let me ask another question, kind of taking uh, your your background and the kinds of examples you've given, and now making some re uh, applications to the listeners and to those that would be reading. What are some of the biggest challenges for Christians in our day to get their minds around? what God has revealed in Scripture. What do you see as a person coming from, say, a broadly evangelical background, trying to go deeper in the Word of God? What kinds of obstacles would you see in their path? Well, I think the two main obstacles that are in the path of anybody, any American or Americanized Christian living in the world, um, are his two main obstacles of the world and the church. Uh, the world in the sense that we get all our all kinds of categories and vocabulary and ways of thinking come to us from our upbringing and the Bible has to exorcise that out of us. It has to make us think in new categories. Uh, it has to make us think about men and women somewhat differently and about children differently and about animals and about stars differently. Um, it's not that all the stuff we learn in school is wrong, it's just that it's not the way the Bible is put. And so when people read in the Bible, for instance, oh, at, in those last days the, the moon will be turned to blood and the sun will be darkened and the stars will fall from the sky, with their modern education they think that's talking about the physical sun, moon, and stars at the end of history. But actually those passages in the, is in the, passages in the Bible are without exception speaking of the last days of a particular society and the sun, moon and stars are the rulers of that society uh, the sun putting on sackcloth means that the ruler goes into mourning for instance like the king of Nineveh did in the book of Jonah so we have to get out of the modern world and into the Bible world and its way of thinking about things in order to be transformed 
And I said the other enemy is the church, and by that I mean the way the church worships. The church is supposed to have the book of Psalms central in her worship. And if, if our minds were influenced by the Psalms, we would have a tremendously rich, symbolic vocabulary in our heads. Because the Psalms are written in the same uh, symbolic, typological fashion as the rest of the Bible. But because our worship consists of pretty much everything but the Psalms, and is mostly nowadays just whatever people make up out of their own shallow religious consciousness, we are not getting exposed to the Bible. In our worship services, we seldom have an Old Testament lesson, an epistle lesson, a gospel lesson, like the traditional church did. We have fallen a long, long way from what the Reformers and the church before that time believed worship should look like. We just more or less come into God's presence and do whatever we feel like doing out of our very shallow religious consciousness. So people are not being transformed. And there is so much you, you almost have to unlearn. Uh, it, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Well, you know, it's not. <laughs> Anybody who's walked with Jesus for very long knows that it can be a pretty rough you know, pretty rough. Uh, this sugar-coated kind of way to think about things is not the way the Psalms are. The Psalms are written by people who are suffering to help people who are suffering and going through rough times and, and going through glorious times as well. But they use language that would plug us into the Bible if we would sing them. So I, I think the church is not helping people. The rituals in the church are not helping people. They're not, they're not plugging people into bread and wine. For instance, if you have crackers and grape juice four times a year, you're not going to be aware of how important food is in the Bible. But there's probably not a, pa a, ch a page in the Bible that doesn't have food on it somewhere. And often the food is bread and wine. It's very pervasive in the Bible, but we just don't see it because our churches are not doing that kind of thing. <laughs> so I think we have to unlearn a lot of what's in the church if we want to start studying get into the Bible very much. Say a word about the series that's also on this um, recording, which deals with uh, rocks, stars, and dinosaurs, how they are um, useful for, for unpacking more of the scriptures. Those two series are done together. They deal with space and time. That is to say, the basic furniture and symbolism that God puts into the world, uh, stones, uh, gemstones, gold and silver, all those things have particular meanings in the Bible. Uh, gold is more valuable than silver. Silver is more valuable than copper. Uh, and there are all these colored gemstones, which are chips of frozen rainbow, and they're around the throne of God. All those kind, that's, that's just one symbol package. And then there's a symbol package of, uh, of stars that we discuss, and a symbol package of animals. And there are a lot of other symbol packages that we didn't go into there, such as wind and oil and things like that that the Bible uses over and over again, and water. But you have this, it, this is like the furniture, the, uh, the, the words that go into making a sentence. And uh, the, 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 uh, the sentence would be like, the tabernacle or something that is made up of these various pieces. And then the second series, The Garden of God, is how these things transform in time. Uh, how God comes into history and makes the world new again and takes it from glory to glory. So the Drock Stars and Dinosaurs sort of introduces the, the furniture of the world and the Garden of God shows how God is glorifying that furniture and, and moving it forward in history. After you do your work in the Bible, after you read it holistically, and after you take into consideration the nature of the literature, um, typologies and imagery and these archetypes of Scripture, what, where do you come out at the end of that? Or the question might be, you know, so what? Why, what is going to be the conclusion of using a more in-depth process to study the Bible? Is it going to change anything in our thinking or our outlook or, practically speaking, uh, our, our life. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the whole point of it is to change the way you look at everything. And it should have that effect because the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to transform our lives. So the more 
fully we come into contact with the Word and the more fully we're dominated by the uh, categories of the Scripture and by the content of the Scripture, the more our lives should change. Now, you know, that's not magical. It doesn't mean that uh, instantly you become a, a saint who's never going to be tempted to uh, swipe or lust or anything else again, but it does mean that you, you, you acquire wisdom. And wisdom uh, gives you perspective on reality, uh, enables you to see through certain kinds of things, and gives you things to say. My interest in these things, you know, people have said to me, why don't you write a book on hermeneutics or something? And my answer is, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in pastoral theology. Um, I'm interested in, in, first of all, I want to know what the Bible says. It's, a lot of this comes out of curiosity. I didn't know what to do with these strange passages in the Bible. And um, I'll say something about that in just a moment. But uh, uh, I want to help other people understand it. And uh, you're writing some technical thing to take up all the ins and outs of what various scholars have said. Uh, there's a place for that, but I'm not going to do it. I, I'm more interested in teaching. You know, uh, one of the most fun things I've read in recent years was um, by Daniel Fuller, and he was talking about just this business of understanding the Bible. And he says, when you read along the Bible, you're, you're reading through some passage, and all of a sudden you come up smack against something really weird that just doesn't make any sense. And he says, that's where, it's at, precisely at that point that you have to say, well, this made perfect sense when it was written. And if it doesn't make any sense to me, I have to change how I think about the world. Uh, one example is you're just reading along and it suddenly it says you shall not boil a kid in its own mother's milk. Well, okay. You keep reading and it never says why. And you think, well, that made sense when it was written. It doesn't make any sense now. So I have to become a different kind of person so that I can understand that. Or my favorite example is that when Jacob wrestles with the angel, and it says the angel reached up and t reached out and touched him in the socket of the thigh. And then, which is interesting, okay, why did he touch him there? Jacob limps from now on. Are there things we can say about that? And then it says, for this reason, the sons of Israel do not eat the muscle that is in the socket of the thigh because he touched Jacob in the socket of the thigh. And you think, what? From that, you know, they just kind of naturally understood that since their ancestor had been uh, hit by God at that particular point and had been made holy, maybe let, let's say perhaps that muscle had made holy, therefore, whenever they kill an animal, they set that muscle aside and don't eat it. Now, you see, that's presupposing an analogy between people and animals. It's presupposing something about continuing what happened to your ancestor. It's presupposing a whole worldview that's not our worldview at all. And so... For that not to be suddenly a weird thing in the Bible, you have to completely change how you look at reality. And so I, I find that, you know, it's, it's those passages that I got to and I said, what? What is going on here? And that made me curious, and then I found that it's a lot of fun to explain it to other people. That's very good. I appreciate the time you've taken to talk through these things, and I hope that uh, the studies that you've given, especially the Garden of God, and rock stars and dinosaurs will be useful to people in helping them get started in the process. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, Greg. My pleasure.